us now is the senior director of the College Football Pro Football Network, Cam Miller, a guy who has long been known for prognosticating awesomeness when it comes to Zach Wilson and others. Cam, welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. I always like to be known as that, a prognosticator of, of awesomeness, essentially. So thanks for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm always happy to be welcomed in uh, as such. So uh, thanks for having me. Zach first. That's what we should yes. uh, font you as. Yes. Yeah. Put that in your uh, social media handles for sure. I'm, I'm going to go to LinkedIn right now, and I'll put that in there after we're done here. So. <laughs> well, with that in mind, you also love Jaron Hall and have deemed him as a top six, top seven quarterback to be taken in the approaching NFL draft. That would have him late first round. So, Cam, why do you like Jaron Hall to go as early as late in the first round? Because we're seeing projections everywhere from the first round all the way back to like the fifth round. Yeah, there's only, I think, one deterring factor to not have him in the first round. It, it'll be his age. I mean, if, if Kenny Pickett's an older quarterback, going to be 24, just turned 24, uh, Jaron, what, 25, as he's transitioning to the NFL, I think that's the only deterring factor. But honestly, it it helps him in a day and age where we just skipped a bunch of quarterbacks in this last NFL draft, and there's a bunch of, you know, bridge quarterback is now a term. Jaron Hall comes in, and he starts from day one, in my opinion. There's a there's multiple intangibles that he has. Every level of the field, the NFL throws, outbreaking routes, 20 yards down the field, throwing receivers open, but it's the little subtle nuances in his game. It's the squaring of his shoulders. It's the arm angles he can throw up from under pressure, and it's navigation of the pocket. There's so many things that he does well that are so subtle, so small, that it takes, you know, multiple looks, multiple uh, rewatches of the plays and games that he's, he's had. So injury history and age deterrent, I guess. But honestly, there's nothing else in his game that he hasn't had that isn't near elite. And what's wild, and you use the E-word, uh, we don't use it in vain on this show, so nicely done. He had a tremendous season last year, a guy that has two years of eligibility, but if he has a great year, it sure feels like, and from what we've heard, that he would bounce and go to the NFL, especially in this situation, he should, right? Um, he's, he's a guy that has waited his turn and last year performed well, and then this year has an opportunity to increase that with more high-profile games. So is there is there a moment or a game that you feel like Jaron needs to seize to be a first round guy to be a second round guy this year on this schedule. Uh, it's probably the beginning slate. Those, those uh, maybe not USF, but it's, it's hosting Baylor and it's hosting the familiarity of the former coaches and coaching staff members. Um, we'll get to Eric Mateos and how he left that the line. I'm sure eventually here, but uh, getting to, to Baylor, but going to Eugene uh, week three, you got to go in there and I, Oregon may not be what they once were, you know, a couple years ago in terms of the secondary play, but there are still some members of that secondary that if he lights up that Oregon secondary um, and just Oregon in general in Eugene, I think that's the moment. That's the game to look at right there is whether or not we're going to see that Jaron Hall all season long. And if that's going to, you know, propel him, I think that's the game that could do it. Cam Miller is with us on BYU Sports Nation. We're discussing Jaron Hall. Uh, we've got the quarterback stuff out of the way, but Cam, we can't help but notice who's protecting Jaron Hall. Blake Freeland has seemed to just fly up draft boards. A lot of people like him in the first round. So who do you expect to go first, Blake Freeland or Jaron Hall? It's tough. I think Blake has the the better chance. I think Jaron's got a really, it's an uphill battle with CJ Stroud, Bryce Young. I mean, if people are even looking at t Tyler Van Dyke from Miami as a first round kid, I don't believe it yet. We'll see. But there's so many good quarterbacks right now. And with so many teams that might be needy it, it, left tackle, I think is very open right now. There is no left tackle one. There's no Evan Neal. There's no Kim Iquano in this draft class right now. I think Blake Freeland could prove himself to be left tackle. If Donovan Smith's of the world are getting $60 million for the Bucks, then it clearly shows how valuable left tackles are but good ones at that. And I think Blake Freeland is a guy who's got size, feet, hands, and his ability to anchor and balance. Balance through contact at left tackle is incredibly difficult to do, and it's a transitional period. But it's one thing that I mentioned to him before, speaking with Coach Mateos, he said Blake Freeland's one of the best he's ever had to do that as well. So that's what he loved about him and, and was sad to leave, if uh, I can quote him there properly. Yeah, Blake Freeland's ascension has been incredible. Quarterback in high school, super mobile. He's put on the weight. He's so quick. It's It's been fun to watch because we've seen multiple uh, outlets say, hey, first round potential top 10 guy. It's like, whoa, didn't realize the ceiling was that high, which is super exciting. But back to the quarterback thing. So Kenny Pickett, only guy taken right in the first round last year. Um, everybody's talked about how this is going to be a better quarterback draft. I don't know if that's just because it wasn't good last year that it's going to be better next year or what the needs of certain teams and timing. Do you feel like Jaron could benefit from, 
hey, say maybe four to seven guys go in the first round next year, that's where maybe he sneaks into the first? Yeah, I mean, he he could. It's it's very possible. It's very likely. I think his pro ready, his pro ready ability will be something that pushes him up into that upper echelon. There's going to be guys that I think they're going to bank on traits. Tyler Van Dyke being one of them um, from Miami. I'll just use him as another example because there's traits, there's elite skills in his arm. But I, whether he has it mentally, Phil Jerkovic from Boston College as well. Whether he has it mentally, he's got some some very good traits in his arm. But I think they're not pro ready. And they won't have that ability to understand systems like Jaron could. So the age might help him there, uh, but that ability to, if he can showcase it again, the linear growth as a quarterback this season going into it, I think that that's what vaults him into it as well. Cam Miller is senior director of college football and the pro football network. Uh, we're talking about potentially BYU having an historic draft because not only are we discussing Jaron Hall and Blake Freeland, they both might go in the first round. We'll see as you were just discussing, but Clark Barrington, Puka Nakua, Peyton Wilgar is the guy that you've been high on in the recent past, and now he's healthy and looking to take that next level jump into the NFL. Throwing Isaac Rex at tight end. So, Cam, how many guys are we talking about that you legitimately think BYU will have drafted in 2023? You have the, you said the five there and then the six as well. If you do throw in Isaac Rex, I, you know, I'm not going to go out as far as say Mason Wake is one of those players as well, but I think if we saw – you know, multiple of those fullback H back types that could transition to one of those pass catching roles out of the backfield or as an inline tight end wakes up there as well. So you have five. I think that's a very high possibility. Six is a bit of a reach. Um, Peyton, unfortunately, his injury history as well and his age will likely ding him a little bit there. I think he's got all around incredible skills, but definitely the next after the top two, it, it's Barrington. Um, and then for future pro prognosticating as well, I think Campbell as well, Campbell Barrington in the next two years for him as well. But Right now, this draft, you have Blake and you have Clark Barrington. I think both can prove to be, I mean, interior offensive line aren't going to be day one, guys. It's going to be a stretch to get them in day two. But at this point, I mean, he's a lock for that day, you know, day three, round four, Barrington, if he keeps showing what he's been able to showcase. When you talked about uh, the offensive line and Eric Mateo, certainly we feel like it's loaded. We're very excited about this offensive line. Christopher Brooks coming in from Cal running behind it. We feel like, hey, it's got to be a thousand yard guy, at least behind this offensive line. What did you learn from your conversations with Eric Mateo, who's at Baylor, who's going to play BYU, about this O-line because uh, the Cougars really like what they've got this year? Yeah, it's uh, how he recruited, I guess. That's probably the best way to say it, and what he left them with the intangibles. Um, uh, isolating what works in the college game, but also what transitions them to the pro level, too, talking with him as well. And that's where the Blake Freeland came up. That's where a couple of his guys now down at Baylor have come up, too. But it's uh, it's balance is one of the bigger things that he stresses as well as you know the ability to road grade to uh lack of a better term get out there and really want to pancake guys that grit the tenacity and that's what this whole line is all about in my opinion they want to you know they want to snatch your head off basically they want to plant you in the ground and i think that's what really stands out about all these guys too they're not just these you know light on their feet great footwork guys they're strong mean and very tenacious at the point of attack i think road grade's the best phrase to use there i love that <laughs> phrase that's an amazing phrase it's a lot of fun. Chris, Chris Brooks, I, there's a reason he came, right? Uh, yes. You got to look at those five and be like, hey, I really want to run behind those guys. I can do a lot on my own, but I'm going to have huge holes to run through this season. We've been looking at correlations between BYU winning a lot of games, finishing ranked, and what that means for players in the draft. How much does a team winning in college correlate to players having their draft stock increased, if you will? it's it's tough to to look at it and say it doesn't help i mean you look at what the national championship there was 16 of them or in the playoffs at least that were first rounders from those four teams alone they won the most games last year georgia with a historic draft they won the nat the whole thing i mean it's it's hard to say that it doesn't actively do good things for you you get more notoriety you, you start to look at it as a scout what's making this team good and you look at the sum of their whole parts as well. And I think that's what ultimately it boils down to. You got to win some of those on the, on the national stage, you know, beating Utah state this year is not going to really quite do it, but beating Oregon, beating Baylor, or even holding your own. I mean, Jared's best game last year, in my opinion, was that second half of the Baylor game. The dude lit it up. And so there's moment there's, there's victories within losses and defeats, unfortunately, because I don't know if we really think we're, we go 12 and 0 as BYU right now. It's possible if Jaron is who we think he is and he gets a little bit of help, but I'm not going to go on record and say that, but no, it, it does. Obviously it helps. Um, it's because you look at it at that. You look at, you know, what's making this team tick, what's making this team good. Ultimately Zach is what made it good. What two years ago now at this point, it feels like we're, uh, where are you two years past that year? That's pretty crazy. But uh, I, I digress. 
uh, it's that's what you look at and you say, hey, what's making them tick? What's making it good? And it's it, it helps. There's no way around it. I'm seeing 12 and 0 through the blue goggles. I don't know what you're talking about, Cam. I, I, I just I just <laughs> yeah, I, I, I see it now. Yeah. Okay. Let's take them off. Uh, oh, 10 and two, still good. Um, will that change? That being BYU has to have this really nice season to really get a a sort of Dax Milne on the radar. Obviously, he he rides the Zach wave with that too. But um, it, do you think in the Big 12 that will adjust for BYU a little bit where they are more visible? They don't have to have this unbelievable year for some of the other guys to get noticed. Yes, because, yeah, you, you look at a team like Texas Tech. They're not noticed on a national stage. I think BYU has a bigger platform nationally than Texas Tech does. But Texas Tech's got that baked in nature where you're scouting Texas players. You're scouting Baylor players, Oklahoma players, obviously, to use both Texas and Oklahoma. Now gone, of course, but or will be gone bad example but you know the, the baked in nature you're going to scout those other big name programs or you're just in big 12 country you just do the whole big 12 loop it's going to help them vastly because you could you know lose a couple of conference games but you're still getting eyes more eyes than you would you know just playing out west or playing on a you know non-big market stage and i, I it, it'll definitely help them there you don't need this meteoric rise from uh you know national to national prominence it'll just you'll sort of be there you'll always be there in the back of the minds of everybody all right, Cam, let's have you go on record because you are the director of college football for the Pro Football Network, and uh, you're all things football. Let's start with this first one. How many games do you expect BYU to win in the 2022 regular season? You're putting me in a really tough spot here. Let me, uh, let's, can we, let's go through the schedule together. And let me let's just go through say the USF schedule, is yeah. a win. USF is a win. Um, I'm, I really like, I think Jerry Bohannon will give them a, a, a good uptick at quarterback play. I like Stimmy McLean. Uh, I, USF is still a few years away. Even Jeff Scott probably knows it as well. Uh, that Baylor game, I think coming to Provo hurts, um, and they got to figure out their quarterback. So I can see that, that as a win as well. I think Bay, Baylor's not quite there, and they need a little bit, you know, some of some of their whole parts um, after losing Bohannon um, and figuring out that issue. I think for 2-0, and oh, I'm going to go on I like it. as well. And, you know, I do have the BYU flag uh, <laughs> in, in the garage. I, I can't not, I can't not wrap them at this point. Beautiful. Let's face it. So, don't tell you fans that who you know. <laughs> I, I posted a Cam Rising video, and they were all up in arms. You know, they they were so confused and so torn. So, <laughs> and good. We'll get to that. I, I wish uh, the Holy War was happening this year. I'm not gonna lie. Um, Oregon is a win. Too much to figure out, too much to overcome, and uh, no Knicks, as I call them, Bo Knicks is not the answer. <laughs> Three and oh, going into Wyoming. You're looking at you're looking at five and oh, wow. going to Vegas, going into Notre, Notre Dame, Dame, baby. So uh, unfortunately, it's five and one after that. Okay. That's fine. Uh, we'll take it. Arkansas, that's probably your bigger wild card there at the end yeah. of the season. If you're looking at eleven wins or tw- or ten because of Arkansas. So. Mm. Not a big fan of KJ Jefferson myself. I think he's a Cam Newton light, but even less accurate as a quarterback passing. So give me a hard fought loss, though, unfortunately. Sam Pittman and that offensive line is too much to, to overcome, um, even at home. Uh, so Liberty, ECU, Boise, Utah Tech, Stanford, something's got to change with the Cardinal. So I absolutely can see 10 and 2. All right. 10 and 2, Cam yeah, Miller. Cam, you're a guy, dude. You're a guy, man. <laughs> hey, I, and I'm, I'm not just doing it to, to, to you know, Given to the masses here, I it, this is a this is a serious roster built uh, yeah. to succeed. Yeah. In season, in season. Does that translate into five draft picks for BYU? That's my second question. Absolutely, absolutely, maybe even more. But uh, I, I love Mason and Air Wake, but I he's not my sixth <laughs> guy. It would definitely be, it'd be Isaac Rex. I love well, in there. I dare say no national guy knows the BYU Cougars better than you. Seriously. You bring it every time, man. You know, you know Mason. I try, I, I try to give this. <laughs> okay, I do. Joe, Joe Wheat helped me out there, so I got to give credit to <laughs> my co hype Joe Wheat, nice. My hype train co conductor, but yeah, it's um, <laughs> it. I I try to get the same level of detail to all 131 now at this point. There's but no it is, way you love deep. them as much as BYU, though. Come on, man. No, come on. Man. No, JMU will will slowly <laughs> encroach us because I'm my entire wife kind of family oh. JMU, so I, I will show some love to my James dogs, Madison. But, is that what you're saying? Yeah, my whole my nice. wife's whole family went to PMU. So now that Very they're nice. coming on board, yeah. yep. it'll be fun. But no, I'm sorry. I, I do love my coots. <laughs> Cam Meller, we appreciate the time as always bringing it on BYU Sports Nation. We'll talk to you again soon. My pleasure, guys. Thanks as always.